Let me briefly say something in the minutes I have left about religion and ethics, because it's a question that often comes up in this course. People say, well, I have certain religious beliefs, um, and my ethical views follow from my religious beliefs. So um, how does that relate to the discussion we're going to have in this class? So there are two things I'm going to say about this. One is a philosophical uh, argument about the relationship between religion and ethics, or about the independence of ethics from religion. And the other is a political point, a point of political philosophy, you might say, rather than of ethics. So the philosophical point is a very ancient argument. It goes back to Plato's dialogue, the Euthyphro. And if you haven't read any Plato, um, Plato's dialogues always have a character in them uh, called Socrates. Uh, ancient uh, philosophers who study ancient philosophy debate uh, the extent to which the character in Plato's dialogue called Socrates actually represents the views of the historical person Socrates. Uh, we don't have any writings from Socrates, so we don't know for sure, but we, um, the general view is that in the early dialogues probably there is a reasonable resemblance between the Socratic, uh, the Platonic Socrates and the actual Socrates, maybe less in the later dialogues, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. Anyway, there's a ca this character called Socrates who um, generally wins the arguments in the, in the dialogue. Um, so he's talking to Euthyphro uh, here, and um, Euthyphro is taking the view that what is good, uh, or actually the discussion is really about what is pious, what, what piety is, but it's a bit, I, I think the, the argument is generalizable to notions of good, and it's clearly more interesting for us to, <coughs> to translate the argument about what is good rather than what is pious. So uh, Euthyphro says, uh, what is pious is what the gods approve of. And um, Socrates then asks, switching to the notion of good, so is something good um, because the gods approve of it, or do the gods approve of it because it's good. And that's the basic dilemma that we need to think about here. Um, if you're thinking about does the idea of what is good or bad, right or wrong, come from what God commands or what God approves? Sometimes called the divine command theory of ethics. And for those who claim it does, the problem is that it seems to suggest that if God had said that what is good is to, let's say, um, uh, kick, uh, kick babies for fun, um, then kicking babies for fun would have been good. Um, and uh, if he'd said it's, it's bad to uh, help uh, a blind person across the street, then that would have been the wrong thing to do. And that's very difficult for us to accept, obviously. If we want to say, however, well, God approves of helping blind people across the street and disapproves of kicking babies for fun, um, because those things are good or bad, uh, bad or good in the order I've said respectively, um, then clearly we have an independent notion of good. The notion of good can't simply be what God approves. And that's consistent with language that is used to praise God, for example. If you want to say God is good, and it, you're not simply saying God is, God is God or God is what God approves, you need to have some independent notion of good or bad. And so I think that, um, that that's right, and that, uh, in that to that extent, ethics has to be independent of uh, religion in that there has to be an independent notion of good or bad or right or wrong, which is not simply uh, something that flows from knowing God's will or God's commands. Now you might though say, you might say, all right, well let's say that the notion of what is good or bad has to in some way be independent, but how are we supposed to know this? How are we supposed to know what is good or 
what is bad um, without divine guidance, without, for example, the lessons from Scripture. Well, um, if you, I put this dear Dr. Laura letter, some of you may know about it, if not, you can, you can go online and Google. Um, there was a TV personality, I guess maybe, well, radio personality, maybe still is, though I don't think she's active now, called uh, Laura Schlesinger. Um, and uh, at some point, she said, homosexuality is, is uh, wrong, and we know it's wrong because it says so in the Bible, and you quote Leviticus, verse whatever. So somebody put up a letter to uh, Dr. Laura online, um, in which he says, you know, thanks very much for your guidance and for telling me that um, homosexuality is wrong because it's in Leviticus. Um, I also note that in Leviticus it says that we can uh, make slaves of our neighboring nations. Um, my friend, however, says that while this applies to Mexicans, it doesn't apply to Canadians. Is that correct? Why can't I make slaves of Canadians? Um, <laughs> And, and then it goes on uh, with various other things um, that, are in, that are also in Leviticus or Deuteronomy or other books uh, of the Bible, um, uh, you know, including things like if somebody works on the Sabbath, you've got to stone them to death. Um, and uh, there's, there's a whole variety of, of different things in this. So the point is, the point of mentioning this is, we are already picking and choosing which things we take from Scripture and which things we don't. Um, Perhaps if you're an you know, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish, ob observant Jewish person, you might be trying to follow all of these. Um, and certainly you won't be eating foods that are prohibited in, in the Bible and so on. But um, with that possible exception, um, I'd say we are all inclined to think that a lot of things that are prohibited by the Bible are things that it's perfectly fine to do. So. Um, we are already using our own judgment about these questions and making our own decisions. Okay, and finally, the political reason, which I think is historically extremely important in this country particularly, um, is that uh, in a country that where a lot of the founders came fleeing perse religious persecution in other countries, where there had been in the 17th century the Thirty Years' War between people of different religious beliefs, um, I think it's easy to see that it's important to say, look, um, let's not fight about which religion is true or false. We don't have a way of proving that to each other. Um, but let's try to separate the church from the state. And if we say that, then um, we need to have some notion of public reason to be able to talk to each other across religious divides. If we only got into moral discussions in order to say, my religion says this, and somebody else says my religion says that, or somebody else says I'm not religious at all, I think this, um, we wouldn't really be engaging with each other in the arguments. And it's important in a, in a democracy with no established religion that we do engage with each other in the arguments. So we need to have some sort of dialogue or discourse that can reach across religious teachings. And that's this concept of public reason, exactly what it involves and how far it goes. I mean, it doesn't really exclude religious ideas, but it suggests they ought to be presented in a way that can appeal to non-believers of that particular religion. So that's really what we're going to be doing um, over the coming weeks. We're going to be trying to talk in ways that do not require any particular religious belief.